I'm Rose Gilzell, the Executive Director of the Breast and GYN Health Project. Today, we welcome Dr. Mary Mengs, the Breast and GYN Health Project's part-time medical consultant. Mary is a retired family practice doctor, and she's a 33-year breast cancer survivor. She's worked at the Breast and GYN Health Project for 12 years. This talk is part of the Breast and GYN Health Project's 25th anniversary activities. BGHP has been helping people with breast and gynecologic cancer on California's North Coast since 1997. Although we don't provide medical care, we do provide high quality education, emotional support, and informational resources. People can get assistance finding a healthcare provider, getting low cost mammograms, support when they're newly diagnosed with breast or gynecologic cancer, and then all the way through their cancer treatment, even past treatment. Today, Mary is speaking about how to be your own best medical advocate. Welcome, Dr. Mary Mengs. Uh, thanks, Rose. And uh, welcome to all of you who have um, joined us uh, across the virtual spaces. I'm really grateful that you're uh, tuning in and I'm gonna do my best to make it worth your while. Uh, as Rose said, I am a family practice doctor and I have had decades of experience seeing patients. Um, one thing I really, really hated uh, for almost that whole time was never having enough time uh, during my appointments. Um, it was so stressful and ugh, kind of crushing to always be behind, always be apologizing to the patients, to be able to see that um, the patient wanted more time, I wished I had more time, and yet there was some compromise and had to keep going and then be even further behind with the next person. It just really was rough. Um, I also have quite a lot of experience being a patient. And um, so I know the frustration of um, having a disappointing visit with a provider. Um, so I've been on both sides and I often think about, oh, if only the docs knew how to be better at making a good visit. Oh, if only all the patients knew what I know about how to make it work better. And a lot of those ideas that I had are what we're going to talk about today. Um, when I transition from my clinical practice to working at the Breast and GYN Health Project, um, one thing I really loved was that whenever I met with a client or called her, we had all the time that we needed, which was sort of revolutionary to both me and the client. If you can imagine being diagnosed with cancer and being told, will you have all the time you need with a doctor? Maybe not your doctor, but a doctor. And it was so relaxing to me and so fulfilling to be able to help that person in whatever way uh, they needed and at whatever pace they needed. So uh, it's good to, to sort of start out with that note about time. Um, no matter how scary the diagnosis or the topic or, or uh, how bad the news is, it's, it's always better to be able to talk it through, to ask questions, get information and check in with your feelings. Um, even with cancer, most people have time to prepare for their visits and to deliberate important decisions they have. And um, it, it's, if you can avoid a panicky feeling, uh, whenever possible, because that just leads to chaos and exhaustion and that overwhelmed feeling. Those are the words we hear most often here at the project. I'm overwhelmed. I'm terrified. I'm exhausted. So again, just taking your time. Most of the time we say to our clients, this is an emergency. You have a little time to figure this out, figure out what you want to do. So right now, maybe all of us together can take a real deep slow breath in and just remember usually you have time to take these tips practice them make the best of the situation you have time now you don't have very much time in the appointment okay um rose told you about the project one thing i want to say is that we're pretty rural up here we only have one oncology practice and um 
so and there's not the depth of um, say uh, spe subspecialists. So a lot of what we do and what we've learned how to how we've learned how to help people is with that kind of scarcity in mind. Um, hopefully, a lot of you, if you live in a more populated metropolitan area, you don't you don't have that so much. But so I'm going to talk today about becoming your own best medical advocate. And when I say that, I I I don't want anybody to think that that means you know the dukes are up. I'm fighting you. Um, I mean effective, effective medical advocate. I mean feeling fierce inside, but not coming across as fierce because that's not productive. Um, I'm gonna review some generic tips and then uh, briefly discuss shared decision-making. And then I'm gonna show you a, a framework of process that I've learned about that helps you organize your thoughts when you have to make an important medical decision. So everything today can apply to any kind of medical condition or situation, even though what we work with, and I might really make most references to the cancer experience um, in oncology. I'm really passionate about this topic because um, few of us have the healthcare system that we deserve. Um, I mean, if you're able to get an appointment without any trouble and you're 100% satisfied with all your visits with, uh, with your healthcare providers, then you're lucky. I don't really know anybody like that. But so we all have to operate in this flawed system that none of us by ourselves can fix or do anything about. And then there's the issue of just the relationship with a provider, which is frequently less than ideal. My list, my wish list, my opinion of what makes an ideal healthcare provider is someone who knows us, who likes us, who cares about us, someone who's prepared and clear and patient and compassionate, and someone who values our input. Um, these things are all extra important when we're talking about cancer and oncology. Um, you want that provider to treat you like they would want to be treated or like they would want their family member to be treated, you know, the good old golden rule. But it just doesn't happen like that very often. We're all human. We, when we're on the patient, we're human and the providers are human. They either never really had that skill or that personality trait or that viewpoint, or maybe that day they're having a bad day and they're extra rushed and extra exhausted. So because you are operating in a flawed system and with imperfect providers, all the more reason why we have to make the best of that situation. Our, our health depends on it. Um, those of you who know me have heard me probably say this a number of times over the years, this metaphor about uh, driving the bus. And it's sort of my view of um, finding out you have cancer and how it feels to be so jarred and you know you're going down your road your life whatever that is and you sort of expect it to go certain places at a certain pace and then all of a sudden you're forced onto a detour you didn't know it was coming uh, you didn't get any choice about it at all and Somebody might be telling you that you're eventually going to get back on your main road, but you have to take that on faith, kind of, right? And um, you just have no idea how long this detour is going to be or what it's going to feel like. Is this a really bumpy ride? Can you trust the driver uh, that's on this bus of your path? Um, some people would really like, it would be kind of nice if when you were diagnosed, you could be completely passive. I mean, sometimes you have sort of have this fantasy of, okay, you give me the bad news, just let me go uh, lay down on a comfortable bed and go to sleep and you do everything that needs to be done and tell me when it's over. I don't want to think about it. I don't want to know about it. Um, not everybody wants that. Some people do kind of fantasize about that sort of passive experience, but it doesn't matter whether it sounds good to you or not, because none of us get that kind of experience. We have to 
keep our eye on the bus driver a little bit. We have to kind of know where we're going. We have to know the terrain of where we're going, what's expected. Um, we have to kind of be prepared, you know, bring your own snacks, um, bring your own whatever you need to be comfortable and calm, bring somebody with you if you need. All that stuff, you really do have to, you don't have to know how to fix a carburetor of the bus, but you do have to be engaged and, um, and you know, know where you're supposed to be at any one time. And I, I wish that weren't so. I think it's plenty, it's more than enough strain on someone just to be given a diagnosis. But the reality is that you do have to be engaged and you have to be knowledgeable. And there are certain responsibilities about the process that fall onto you, unfortunately, to have a decent outcome. All right, so let's get started now. I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about these generic tips uh, first. Um, and we're ready for that slide, uh, Bree. I didn't make this list, but I'm very appreciative of it because it really helped organize a lot of my ideas. Uh, I've got a lot to say about most of these things. So um, we'll start with trust what you know. We're gonna talk about this um, a little bit more later on, but um, you are the expert on you and not just your body, but your thoughts, your preferences, your values, That's that's your expertise and, and in, it should be valued. So trust it. Okay, the next one, um, keep a journal of what you're doing and feeling. Um, I could really expand on this a lot. Those, those of you who have been our clients, if you get chemo, we give you a free bag with some stuff in there. There's usually a journal. Um, I really recommend this um, for you know things like your thoughts and feelings. Um, I remember a famous, well-known author, Garrison Keillor, heard him say once, you know, that he never really knew what he thought about something until he started writing and um, I wrote about it. And it's all some magical process where things can be, we can feel super confused and overwhelmed. And if we start the exercise of trying to write anything about it, that almost magically from our subconscious out through our fingers onto a keyboard or a pen comes our feelings and thoughts. And that can be so illuminating and valuable. So I really recommend that. But also just on a practical thing to keep notes about your visit, your treatment and your treatment side effects um, and your symptoms. Um, you and you have follow-up appointments with your treating docs, they're gonna probably wanna know, and it's really good to have dates and sort of descriptions and amounts somewhere, try to keep a kind of list or even a calendar of your treatment side effects and your symptoms. Um, all right, kind of a different binder, a different journal is um, your medical records binder. So maintain your own records. Again, if you're our client, we give you a, a binder, medical records binder, and but you can make your own. It's really simple. There's not very many rules. Um, some of the tabs that we have that I think are really valuable, some of the categories are your imaging results, your pathology lab results, your doctor reports, um, insurance information. Uh, we have a clear plate page that goes into the binder that has little pockets for all the business cards. And so it's so great. You can see on both sides, the names of all your docs and their phone number and their, um, and their fax number, et cetera. Another clear plastic sleeve will hold discs. So sometimes when uh, you've had some imaging and maybe you're gonna go to a different doctor, you're gonna uh, request a disc from the uh, radiology place. And then the other doctor can view your say MRI or mammogram or PET scan, whatever. So, and the other thing that's really good to have in there is um, a calendar. A, uh, it's so valuable. I can't tell you how many times people have looked back and said, I'm really glad I wrote down when my appointments were for um, whatever, all your follow-up and all your treatment. So it can be useful to keep you organized while you're in treatment, but hang on to it because it's a really useful archive for afterwards. Now, um, 
your medication list is another thing that can go in here. This is all predicated on one of the key parts about being a good medical advocate, and that's getting comfortable requesting your records. Your records belong to you. You have complete um, right to them, to any records, and uh, nobody should give you a hard time about that. I mean, they might ask you to sign something. Okay, fine. But most of the time when you say, I need a copy of this, please, um, all they have to do is push a button on their computer and psh, out comes another copy. It's no big deal. Um, not like the old days when they used to take a chart apart, you know, the brads and take out page by page and go to the copier. That's the old school. So get comfortable requesting your records. One of the most useful records is the, your notes from your doctor, your, your oncologist, if you're a cancer patient. They follow a certain format. They're pretty organized and succinct. And it tells you as a summary of the visit. It might be called a consultation note or a progress note or a visit summary. Basically, it's a doctor's note from your appointment. And it's going to have what your doctor thinks is going on and what their plan is for you. So not only is it good for your records and good to share with some of your other doctors, but if you didn't catch everything in an appointment, you want to know what did he say my treatment's going to be? it'll be written in there. So you, you can get it, you can ask for that. I, I recommend it and get comfortable with that. The benefit of having your binder, your medical records binder, several benefits. I'm, you can't see I'm in my lap. I'm sort of holding my hands like this, like I'm holding the binder in my hands because I've seen so many clients come in here and I know that's, they take it to their doctor's office, their doctor appointments. Um, it, it lets you feel, it helps you feel organized. And the less chaos, the more organized and more in control you can feel, the better. You can't control a lot of this experience, but you can control and organize your medical records and it'll help you feel better. But also I'm pretty sure that once your provider knows what you're holding in your lap, they, uh, that's a, a big clue to them that they better stay on their toes because you know what's going on. All right, you're an engaged, um, partnering kind of patient. All right, be informed about your illness and be involved in your own care. All right, this is a little nuanced as far as I'm concerned. Um, remember about driving the bus, you don't have to be the expert. So you do need to be informed about your condition and somewhat about the treatment. You need to be informed enough to know what's going on, to know what the next steps are, to know what you uh, what decisions you want to make um, and what's coming what's coming next and what you've been through you do need to know some stuff but you just need to be careful and not feel too much pressure about how expert you do need to be um, again the internet what would we do without it when the, when this project was new I, I didn't work here in the early years but I know that they had boxes and file cabinets full of articles and papers on every kind of information they wanted to give to clients. And it would all be on paper. It'd all be like, oh, you need to know about what HER2 positive means or what, da, da, da. let me go and find out in the file drawer and hand you the paper on it. Um, so luckily those days are behind us and we know good places to look. We all do it, look it up on the internet. That's great. Beware, one thing I would say is beware of blogs because blogs are somebody's own experience. Sometimes a doctor responds, but they're generally not medically vetted. And I have read those a lot where it's not just somebody's experience, but it's whatever they're relating medically isn't exactly accurate. So just be careful when you're looking on the internet, be, be wary of blogs. And even really good legitimate sites, um, it's easy to kind of wander off from what pertains to you to what doesn't pertain to you and to get, you know, too much junk in your head and, and unnecessarily frightened. So I'd say this is a challenging one. It's really hard to know what are good, useful sites. If you're our client, that's something we want to help you with. Um, you know, maybe American Cancer Society can help with that. Breastcancer.org. There's a lot, a lot of good 
good sites and you should take advantage of them because sometimes they have sources of support and tips for coping with treatment as well as just information, but, but be careful. Okay, next, be prepared. Yeah, be prepared for your visit. This is really good. Remember what I said about, you know, there's never enough time and it's so easy for both the provider and you to be frustrated. And the antidote, the best way to deal with that is, is to be well prepared. You know, not all patients realize this, but a provider comes into a visit with an agenda. All right. They, you know, they know well, the things that they have to find out assess and explain. And, you know, of course, when we're a patient, we have our agenda. Here's what I want to find out. Here's what I need to ask. Here's what I need him to tell me. Here's what I want him to hear. So you have two different agendas and sometimes it's kind of a battle. And, you know, unfortunately the provider's usually going to win because they kind of control a visit. So the best, again, the best strategy is to be organized and be succinct. Um, try and be a good historian of yourself. So here's an example that used to happen a lot. You'd ask a patient, how long have you had blah, 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 nausea, back pain, fill in the blank. And the worst answer, but I heard it a lot was, oh, I don't know, a while. And I have no idea what a while means. No, no provider does. So please, it doesn't have to be super precise, but please say something more like, oh, that just started last week or, oh, a month or so, or, oh, I've had that for years. Try and be specific and succinct. You don't have to give the whole long story about how well you think you had it when you went to Uncle Joe's birthday party, but then maybe not, you know. It's, even if the doctor is interested in that, detail of your life there just isn't time so be succinct be prepared be specific you know have your binder and all your your treatment notes with you so you can answer questions and then the questions you want to ask you want to have your list made ahead of time and you want to prioritize it um, there's there's usually not time for all your questions um, especially well i mean if you have cancer and you're seeing your oncologist then there should be there should be um, if you're in primary care and you're going to see your regular primary care doctor, I know people who are really smart, but they don't like going to the doctor. And so their strategy is to make like the big long shopping list and not to go until it's a full page. And then they think it justifies going to the doctor. That's a recipe for big disappointment and that will ruin that doctor's day. There's just no way he or she can address so many different things in the amount of time. So you're, it's a recipe, you're setting them up to fail and to disappoint you. So prioritize, you know, just uh, again, if it's, if it's, if it's his cancer and you're seeing your oncologist, okay, all your questions are appropriate. Um, if it's a different kind of doctor, primary care, stick to what's most important and what's in their uh, domain. Um, one last thing about being prepared and questions is just, just be careful of the, um, the sort of questions that are impossible for your doctor to answer. Um, like how, how will chemo be for me? Or, I mean, the doctor can't give you a prognosis on how long you'll live until you're really sick. So just be, be mindful of that. Okay, we'll move on. Don't be afraid to ask questions. For sure, don't be afraid. Um, ask questions to clarify what the provider said. And um, then of course, ask your own questions. We've already kind of talked about that. Um, uh, the best way to think about questions, especially about treatment, but this applies to medications as well, anything your doctor is suggesting for you is, Think of it in this term and ask the question like this. What are the risks or the harms versus the benefits? Um, that's how you should think of it. And your doctor owes you an explanation that you can use in that framework. What do I get out of this? What benefit comes to me? 
And what are the side effects or the risks um, to that? The costs, and I don't mean just financial, I mean the, the cost as far as side effects or you know, what am I gonna lose by this? Risk benefits. I don't know, your doctor might not be happy to try and explain it to you like that, but that's really um, what they owe you. Okay, take notes. I am not so sure about this one personally. I think it's really hard to take notes and listen and be engaged. Um, it's great if you can do it. It's more important to be paying attention. So one thing you can do instead is record the visit. Usually the provider won't mind. You can, most people can report, record on their, on their smartphone or you can bring a tape recorder. And even better if you can, in addition or instead, is bring someone with you. I know that in pandemic times, you're not usually invited to bring somebody into the room with you. Um, although maybe that might be changing. And um, certainly if your visit is uh, by um, you know, Zoom, a telehealth visit, then you can have somebody there. It's just invaluable to have another set of ears. And so I think the best is both recorded and have somebody there. Um, you can tell that person ahead of time if it's one of your support people, you know, I don't want you to ask any questions. I just want you to be listening. It's so easy, especially if you're at your oncology appointment to, you sort of have this background music of all these ideas, all these reactions, all these, your own fears and thoughts. And it's real easy to sort of lose the thread of what the doc is saying. And, you know, if you're watching Netflix, you can just back up and say, oh, I spaced on that, but you don't get that chance in a live conversation. So another person and a recording, really good. Um, okay, give feedback. Uh, yes, give feedback. I mean, this is all about you and it's probably a pretty important topic. Um, you do try to be pleasant and polite. Remember that, um, you know, your doc might be feeling pretty stressed, might um, be having a bad day, and it's pretty easy to make the provider feel defensive, and um, not much good is going to come out of that. I mean, you would think that um, your healthcare provider with the huge ego and all the accomplishments doesn't feel defensive very easily, but, um, but if you're if you're uh, telling them stuff that you're dissatisfied with, they can, and it's, it's probably not gonna help you. We're gonna come back to that topic in a minute. All right, right now, as a matter of fact, because this kind of leads us to don't give up. Um, it is really easy. There's so much to be frustrated about. And you can be frustrated about your personal diagnosis and your situation or how you're reacting to your treatment or all the broken pieces of the healthcare system or all the imperfect things with your provider, um, et cetera, et cetera. It's a long list, it's, it's really easy. But I think um, you wanna always keep in mind, what do you want to accomplish in this visit? What is realistic to accomplish? And you should be able to answer that in a sentence or two. Um, you can say, I want him to hear how bad this medicine is making me feel, or I want to know what he thinks about this, or I need an answer about this. Um, you know, there should be something specific and practical that you want to accomplish. And then think, if I bring up how mad I am that I had to wait in the waiting room for an hour for him, um, if I spend our precious minutes on that, is that gonna help me get to my goal? It probably isn't. I mean, he might feel really bad, he or she, um, but there isn't anything he can do at that point. And again, tick-tock, tick-tock. So things like that, you know, oh, nobody ever called me back when, you know, you said you were gonna order a mammogram, but no one ever called me. I mean, you do need to bring that to somebody in the office, but maybe not during that precious time of that visit. Um, uh, you know, when the clock is ticking, it's better if you can sort of park those things. So, you know, there's a lot of um, words that start with P that come under this category, like try and be patient, 
be pleasant, be persistent, be polite. You know, a lot of times I, I sort of feel like if you're not getting what you need, you need to be nice enough that whether it's the receptionist, the scheduler, the doctor, whoever really wants to help you. Okay. Because if you're antagonistic, they don't, they're less motivated. Even if they know they should, they don't, it's just not as pleasant for them. So, but also be prepared and be practical about what's realistic to accomplish. Um, it's, it, and you don't have, when I say pleasant, it's okay. If you have cancer, if you feel crappy, you don't have to be all fake sweet. You can tell them how crappy you feel, but I guess it's a matter of sort of not um, making it, making that doctor feel under attack. Okay, that's don't give up. Um, you don't have to do this alone. This is really important. I, uh, I know a lot of people who are real private um, and I respect that. Um, I'm pretty private too. You don't need to tell everybody that you know what you're going through, um, but, but I think you really should have at least one or a couple people that are helping you. I mean, that can be your you know, partner, sibling, friend, roommate, coworker. If, you, if you're one of ours, it can be one of us. Um, but this is someone who might accompany you to appointments or um, just sort of be your main person that you can offload you know, tasks and favors to at home. Um, you know, so some people are support group people, some people aren't. Uh, you can find online support groups. Um, but I know it's cancer in particular is a lonely enough journey. Um, really encourage you not to try to do it alone. Um, um, you know, and, and think about what your friends or what people who know you can do for you. Like be specific, because if you don't, they're either going to think of their own things when you might get five casseroles a day, or they're going to back away and say, oh, it's not comfortable being around her. I'm going to back away. You don't want that either. Get a second opinion, maybe. That really depends on your situation. You don't have to, but you have the right to. Um, and understand your insurance benefits or be familiar with them. Absolutely, yes. Um, if it looks like that's keeping you from getting the treatment that you need, um, first thing, some cancer, some oncology departments have financial navigators, so you can ask them for their help, and your insurance card or whatever insurance you have has um, an 800 number on your card. You can always start there. There's usually somebody that you can take your questions or your grievances to if you think that's being a barrier to your care. And the last thing on here, self-care. Self-care is so important. Yes, yes, yes sleep, eat, move, do mindfulness meditation, relax and refresh. Um, I remember one, one client who told me that when, before she started chemo, she fixed up her bedroom. Really, she bought some new bedding and she made it pretty and she made it really comfortable because that was going to be her sort of recovery space. So don't skimp um, on, on yourself and what you need and what will make you feel better. And don't forget things like socializing and your spiritual practice and maybe a gratitude journal and, and even humor. Um, those can all help you get through it, get through your treatment. And in the process, the better you're, you're getting through your treatment, the better you're gonna be interacting with your providers. So, okay. Now um, I'm going to, done with that, Liz, for a minute, talk just real for a second about something called shared decision-making, which is an official practice, academic uh, practice. It doesn't have to be formal, but it is an official thing. And it's based on the premise of recognizing that in an ideal situation, the provider has expertise for the condition and the choices that you have and the patient has expertise about their own preferences and values and goals. And that those two expertises meet in a 50-50 proposition to arrive at deliberation and decision that best suits the patient, both medically and personally. So shared decision-making is way, way more than mm, signing uh, informed consent. 
uh, and it's not practiced very often, hardly at all, really in its true sense. Um, um, I'm gonna show you now sort of a framework that can help you that we use when we meet with clients, help you sort of organize your thoughts. Um, this is pertinent as it is the practice of shared decision-making. When you have um, a choice to make for a medical uh, decision. So it doesn't apply to emergencies, obviously, but sometimes there is a condition or situation that's called preference sensitive, which just means there's two or more reasonable choices to make. And it can be really complicated to make those choices. Um, this applies, and we've used it here for years uh, for cancer related decisions, but boy, it's used or it can be used a lot for, um, boy, should I get a knee replacement now? Or should I just keep doing physical therapy and injections or something else? So it's not limited to cancer. I learned this process in this framework at um, UCSF when I first started at Breast Health Projects and one of the most valuable, useful things I've ever learned. So five sections. And again, this is what we would do when um, I or staff here would meet with clients as sort of an exercise uh, service to help them with. But it's something you can do with yourself or you can you and your support person can do it. It's good if there's someone who's sort of taking notes and listening and asking deeper questions, but you can do it yourself to organize your thoughts. So the first section is just your situation, details about your condition. The purpose of sort of reviewing this for yourself is to identify if there's any gaps and, and to start keeping your list of questions because that's really at the end we, the product of this process is either you've made a decision or, and, or you have a list of questions. So are there things about your diagnosis that are not clear to you or certain tests you've had? You might say, I don't know what that test was for, and I don't know what my results were, and I don't know what that means for me. Um, so think about if there's any gaps in your understanding about your medical situation, your condition and keep note of those. All right, the next section is choices. This is your treatment options as you understand them, two or more. And one example um, that I think is not that unusual and that mm, people can understand for purposes of illustration is if you have breast cancer and you talk to your surgeon or you're going to be talking to your surgeon and your choices might be to have a lumpectomy to have a mastectomy with reconstruction or to have a mastectomy without reconstruction. That is a super complex decision. So the, this section is just to simply list what you think your choices are. Am I gonna have chemotherapy or not? Am I gonna get my treatment locally or out of the area? Am I gonna take my aromatase inhibitor or not, et cetera. All right, number three is the most important objective. This is your personal goals and preferences regarding your condition and your treatment. And, and this, you really need to dig and keep questioning yourself. What is most important to you? What's your objective, your goal, your, your biggest wishes? What, or maybe you can think, what are you most afraid of? What are you willing to put up with? What are you not willing to put up with? So, um, Really think about this. If you're helping someone do it and they say, I don't want chemo no matter what, um, say why, what is it about it? And try and get um, underneath and get specifics. Example, common example of this might be my objective is to live as long as I can. I'll endure, you know, whatever treatment I need to. It's all about time. And some people might say, no, it's all about quality. And some people might say, it's all about being independent or being able to work. Um, so think about what's most important to you. Your provider is not gonna know that. No way they can. Uh, number four, people, just who helps you make decisions, who's in your life, who influences your decisions. It's okay for that to be nobody or just the, just the doc I'm gonna be listening to, but I make up my own mind. Some people like, oh, I would always make this in conjunction with my spouse or my kids or my family whatever, no wrong answers. And then the last one, evaluation. 
when you've kind of gone through, and I'm trying to talk kind of fast, but we have, we spend usually an hour on this process. Evaluation, where do you stand once you've sort of thought through this? Um, um, have you made up your decision, all, your mind already? Um, and if not, what do you need? And what's your next step and what do you need? Um, and what kind of questions have you come up with? So there's a way to think about this. And this is a last slide, Brie. Um, to evaluate your objectives, here it comes, yeah, your choices, like one, two, three choices, you would list them down the column, and then across the top, write down what were your goals, what are your, you know, one, two, three goals, and then match them up and see where they intersect, what, how does, if I made, if I choose number one, how does that satisfy objective one, goal two, etc. cetera. Um, it's kind of like a variation of a pro and con chart, but it just shows you, or it lets you look at your choices and how they help you accomplish or meet your goals and objectives. Um, and again, uh, this should lead you to some specific questions. So if one of your choice, one of your objectives is, I need to miss as little work as possible for my treatment. And you know, your treatment, your choices are one, two, two or three different treatments or approaches. You can you might say, how long would I be off work? How long would I be in the hospital? Et cetera. Specific questions. Um, okay. That is that is everything I have. That's just an example of a tool when you have a decision to make. Sometimes people don't have a major decision. Some people rather just accept whatever their doctor, or their specialist, their oncologist says. Okay, that's fine. Uh, as long as you understand what it entails and you're comfortable, there's no right or wrong way. You don't have to um, make it a big deal, but, uh, but often there is a choice. And um, it, this just helps, I think, to really help you organize an approach. And remember, you know, I would recommend going through this exercise and then, putting it away, you know, let's say, all right, so I have this image, let's take off the top of my head, pour in one beaker or maybe six beakers of information and then see what cousin Sally and mom and, you know, hubby and everybody else thinks, see what all the doctors think, put all that in there and then go watch a funny movie and let it marinate. Um, let it the amazing process of sort of seeing what feels and uh, right to you. I think you'll get to your your decision and then um, share that with your provider. That's what I have. I hope it helps. Thanks, Mary. This is Rose coming back. Hey, I have some questions for you. Sure. Um, so you mentioned a second opinion. What, what for those of us who haven't been haven't had a medical issue? Why would someone get a second opinion? What is that? Well, if you feel that the interaction with your provider and the treatment that is proposed there doesn't feel right, or if you feel not listened to, if you feel dissatisfied, if you suspect maybe there's another approach that your doctor doesn't offer. I mean, you can try first questioning that provider. Um, uh, you can, I guess a second opinion is sort of like um, going to uh, switching doctors, but you can do it before you switch doctors. You can just say, I want another opinion. It's, it's like shopping. Um, and it can be really important. Sometimes this big specialized center has doing clinical trials and research on a type of uh, treatments that your provider might not be familiar with um, or might have access to a specialist that your provider doesn't. Um, it's it, it kind of just depends on where you're getting your care um, and how you feel about it. Uh, so it's both things. It's sort of the level of expertise that you perceive is available to you at your initial place and the quality of the experience for you. Great, thank you. 
Hey, another question. Um, so how would you make, how would you recommend us as a patient dealing with a provider who we feel isn't listening to us? Mm -hmm. Well, I think, you know, start with the, that provider and in, again, in a way that doesn't put them too much on the defensive to say, um, you know, I just want to repeat this question, or it's really important for me to get my answer, you know, give them the benefit of the doubt if it's, you know, about one thing. If it's a general trend, um, depends again on the setting where you're getting your care, you might say, um, I want to see a different provider. Um, if it's a more serious complaint, um, you might find who the medical director is. Um, kind of, it kind of depends on the setting and how serious the problem is, mm -hmm. how you might escalate. Um, yeah. Okay, it's you. tough. I don't think you should necessarily, you don't swallow it. Don't be quiet about it. Um, what, but again, keep in mind what you want to accomplish. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What if I feel like the, um, the care that I'm getting is dangerous. I'm worried that they're going to be, you know, tr treating other patients like this. Well, then I think you're potentially advocating not just for yourself, but for other potential patients. Great question. Um, and then I really would look for a, um, you know, medical director or a practice administrator, or even a, if it's a hospital associated um, practice, you know, a hospital administrator. I mean, outright medical abuse can go to your state medical board, but if it's just care that you think is dangerously substandard, um, I would look for an administrator um, or a medical director of that, of that practice or that hospital or the sort of the medical group that it's associated with. Nowadays, there's, not, there's a lot less private practices than there used to be. And a lot of times people are part of a large system of care. Mm -hmm. Um, usually if you look within there, you can find some kind of grievance process. There's also like on your insurance statements, there's um, usually some wording about grievance and it's, it might be not just about the insurance, but about the quality of the care. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thank you. Hopefully we're not having to deal with that very often, but sometimes. Well, it is sort of at the extreme end of how to advocate for yourself. Mm -hmm. Um, while you were speaking, um, I had a thought about something that I learned here at the Breast and GYN Health Project. I hadn't ever thought about um, when I bring someone, when I invite someone to attend a doctor's appointment with me, negotiating that person's role when they come. Are they just a note taker? Um, are you, should I say, you know, be an advocate for me? Um, you know, maybe they will offend the doctor. Maybe we should, maybe I can say only ask, make sure these questions get answered for me. Um, I hadn't thought about that, how important that might be for my relationship with that doctor as well. Right. Yeah, I think it's, um, it's, it's also really about, again, having a successful productive visit. So what are you comfortable with? And it might be, you know, Here's my list of questions. Please make sure I don't forget anything. Um, uh, you know, there's all variations on this. I know there are some uh, couples or some people who, you know, one person speaks for the other one a little too much maybe. And we always encourage someone to speak up for yourself if you're the patient. But if it's a matter of it not going to happen at all and, you know, it's better for someone that you bring to advocate for you than for no one to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I, I think as best as you can in, sort of imagine and envision that ahead of time and discuss it with your person that you bring with you. And then just, you know, your provider's gonna know, obviously you have someone with you. They've seen it all, all variations of that before. Um, it, the provider is not comfortable if the person who accompanies takes over. Mm -hmm. So you might, that might be a common thing to say. It's like, don't take over. Don't, <laughs> don't answer questions for me. Mm -hmm. um, but I feel like that just is part of a lot of, that's like 
in the domain of marital counseling, <laughs> uh -huh. such as medical advocacy. Yep. <laughs> this has been awesome, Mary. Thank you so much. You've covered so much. Did you have any last um, last thoughts before we uh, stop? No, I don't think so. I just wish everyone the best of luck. Well, thank you so much for your awesome work. Uh, uh, for people who are listening, thank you for listening. Please stay tuned. We have a short video about the Breast and GYN Health Project at the end of this webinar. Thanks for being here today. Bye. I did a self exam, like they say in the shower one day and said, oh, here's a lump. And I really didn't take it seriously. It was in 2003 and I found a lump about here. I had gone in for my mammogram and then they found something. So then I went back for a biopsy. It was a mammogram, and in those days they didn't send you the report that says no cancer. They sent it to the referring physician, who they just kind of forgot to tell me that I should go back in six months and get another checkup, another mammogram. It was obviously a shock, as I'm sure a lot of people would say. So the biopsy was then sent to my then family practitioner, who called me in and um, it was a real jolt. Well, there's no way to avoid it, Judy. You have cancer. Whoa. <laughs> I had breast cancer. I had breast cancer. It was DCIS, fortunately only stage two. And I can remember that moment really well. It, it was a really frightening experience you might as well drop a ton of bricks on top of me. I really held out hope that it was not cancer. As we all know, only your hairdresser knows, <laughs> and it was from my hairdresser. And so when I told her about my newly discovered breast cancer, she said, well, you know about Breast and GYN Health Project, so... She insisted from that moment I come down here and talk to y'all. This project is really unique in that all the services it offers are free. I work as what's called a warm liner. I have a group of clients that I call and check in with. They're really great there at Radiation Oncology, aren't they? Yeah. And just being able to call and say, I'm really scared and have somebody say, yeah, okay, let's talk, or do you want to come in? So that level of attention, people listening to me and giving me back what I needed was very important. Sometimes that warm liner and staff person is the only consistent thread through a cancer patient's experience. They go from different department to different department, but our warm line volunteer follows them that whole journey. For me, the most valuable is is definitely still the, the support groups. For me, it was definitely probably the support groups. Being able in those support groups to support other people. Getting to go there and laugh and cry and be angry and it's all accepted. You know, nobody's judging me for still processing and we're obviously not always on the same position in the timeline, but we can still, you know, empathize and sympathize with their journey and they'll still do the same for me. I was getting ready for my mastectomy and I really wanted to talk to somebody who had had a mastectomy because I wanted to be prepared. You know, of course the surgeon can talk about what that actual process is gonna be, but I wanted to talk to somebody who had had that surgery and woke up after it without their breast. And how best to prepare for that. It hasn't changed a lot in how many people, how many women have breast cancer nationwide since I was diagnosed. So I don't see that changing anytime soon. It just seems like we have to be there. Best and 
OBGYN Health Project. May I help you? Oh, thank you. Agent Henry. Thank you. I'm Rose Gail Zolik, and I'm the Executive Director at the Breast and GYN Health Project. There are other cancer resource centers, but most of them are part of a hospital or health system. There really aren't very many community-based cancer resource centers like the Breast and GYN Health Project. Part of what makes our organization really unique is that since we started, we've always had a doctor who's been available to do um, education and consultations with the staff and the volunteers and with the clients. I'm Mary Mings. I am a family medicine physician. Our main sort of mission and goal is to support any person going through the experience of a potential or concern for breast or gynecologic cancer or the diagnosis and then everything that comes after that. So that may involve meeting on phone or in person if someone meets with me, a lot of times it's to review the medical reports they already have, like their pathology report, and to help them understand that. And, you know, sometimes that includes someone who doesn't want to take any or all of their recommended conventional medical care. And we sort of put aside our own personal feelings about that because we're here to support that person. My name is Madeline Amir, and I am the Co-Client Services Director at the Breast and GYN Health Project. So one of the resources that we have is the Breast Nest. And inside the Breast Nest, we have gently used mastectomy bras. We also have gently used wigs, a plethora of hats and scarves and head coverings. And so it's a really lovely resource, and all of our services are free, and all they're all donated. We do have a lending library here at the Breast and GYN Health Project. It's the biggest lending library kind of north of the Bay Area, and it has topics that are beyond the clinical aspects of cancer. There are cookbooks, lots of cookbooks. There's children's books. There's some books in Spanish, yoga, spirituality. It's a wonderful lending library. We have a great tool called the Medical Records Finder. The other piece that's really important in here is a calendar because you're going to get all this information thrown at you really quickly and you're going to get an awful lot of medical appointments thrown at you and you have to make sure that you're not double booking and you have to make sure that you're getting everything organized. The Breast and GYN Health Project is celebrating 25 years and it's still going strong and it's still doing its original mission which is to help people negotiate and get through this diagnosis. For me, and I think so many people I talk to, it's the support people give you, how valuable that is to pass that on. 